Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And today I'm joined by Daisy Abbott. Oh, look, I have to say I'm pretty excited because, you know, it's about games and it's been a while since we played a game. Um, but I really enjoyed the last game we played. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty obsessed about the whole games-based learning approach. And I think if we want to learn more, then you're the one to talk to, Daisy. <laughs> Don't oversell it, Kenji. <laughs> Right, I'm going to share my screen and I'm also going to share a um, Miro link so that you can follow along on the Miro yourself. Uh, however, I can't remember. Yes, I think you can edit things. So if you want to drop notes onto this Miro board, you can. Um, also, the Miro board is going to be kind of yours to look at for as long as you like. So um, this is a copy just for this session. So I'll just pop a, a link in the chat and then we can start talking. So the way I'd like to run this session is you are going to shout out what you want me to talk about the most because this board is stuffed with things and I do not have time to talk about all of them in half an hour. I'm desperately <laughs> trying to get the chat box to appear so that I can, uh, so that I can actually give you the link i would have typed it in manually for you but it's and it's refusing it's, to do it I, whenever weak. you share i'm just going to stop sharing so that i can do it and then <laughs> right there we go okay here's here's the link so you can do you can drop notes on here if you like you can unlock things and mess around with them but try not to during the talk something always goes a bit chaotic whenever you're using a mirror uh, for an interactive presentation um so do join me on the Miro board. And if you if you don't like Miro or you can't access it for whatever reason, just follow me in the shared screen instead. So this is um, switching to playful online teaching. Uh, the focus is on online tools today. Uh, my heady successes and abject failures. So if I uh, invite you to come to the big board here, I'm definitely going to talk about the quest for personalized learning. In fact, I'm probably going to start with that because that's my newest thing. Um, but after that, I want you to just shout out a heading and I will talk about it. OK, so to get us started, let's talk about quests for personalized learning. So you can click on this and it should uh, open up um, an itch.io link for you. It's not doing it. I'll just unlock it all. Um, so again, I'll paste this link in the chat. So this, what I've done here is create a, um, an interactive narrative, which is very, um, at the moment it's pretty basic because this is a first draft. Um, so what this is, is a sort of fake pseudo fantasy adventure where as you go through the adventure, you choose options that are suitable to you. And the whole point of this is it's about designing a research project. So you choose at the beginning whether you're one of my students or not, because things happen if you're one of my students. If you're not, that's fine. You get all the same content. Uh, and then you choose I'm doing a research project or I'm doing a creative project. And then as you move through the, the screens of this um, of this quest, you get different options and different learning material that is suitable for the stage you're at. So if you pick, I have no idea what I'm doing, you're taken to a screen full of kind of um, idea generation exercises. And if you pick something like, you know, I already have an idea, but I need to make it more rigorous, then you're taken to research design activities for, for that stage in your project. So I invite you to have a go at this, share it with your students if appropriate. It's, it's aimed at my master's students, so that's the level it's at, but all the activities are optional. So people, you know, you don't have to do them if you don't want. And I would really desperately like uh, to do some kind of proper research, collect the data and do some proper research and publish something about this approach. So if you fancy it, it's completely voluntary, but if you do fancy it, you could also fill in the survey, which appears at the beginning and at the end of the quest. And just let me know what you think, because this is only a first draft. So there's that. I'll tell you how I did it. If we go back to the Miro board, um, it's done in a tool called Twine. Has anyone ever used Twine? OK, 
Kenji has. Um, so it's it's quite an easy, quite accessible tool for designing interactive nar narratives like hypertext adventures, basically. And it outputs an HTML file that you can drop anywhere on the web. I've used itch.io to deliver it, but you can put it anywhere. So this is what you're seeing here, all these kind of little square boxes. This is the, the narrative design. So this is the choices that people are offered um, and, and how, how they get to different parts of the quest. And there's also a badging system, which is run through a tool called Flippity. If you've ever used Flippity, there's some quite fun teaching tools on Flippity. Um, there's a link here, Kenji, if you can paste that into the chat, that would be great. Um, actually, that's, that's to my specific badging database, but Flippity itself, flippity.net, has loads of different tools for teaching. And it means that you can use a Google Doc to basically do a, a sort of interactive digital badging system for your students, if that's motivating to them. All right, so I can take questions about the quest right now, or you can shout out something else for me to talk about. So I have to ask, so the, why did you choose that particular format for the game? The idea of that kind of branching scenario, um, what do you call them? It was the one that even Ian Livingston did. The, um, Choose your own adventure. Choose your own adventure yeah. type format. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so why, why that format? Excellent question. I chose this because I have a very diverse cohort of students all doing uh, an independent research project. Some of them have even done PhDs when they come to do our masters. Some of them have come from degrees that have no academic writing in them at all, like a fine art degree. Uh, some of them, quite a lot of them, are doctors or dentists. Some of them ha have an undergrad degree, but nothing else. They're very diverse. Their subjects are very diverse. Their engagement with independent research is very diverse. So when I'm teaching, it's a, it's a perennial challenge for me to, to teach the material that needs to be taught whilst engaging people who have never written a dissertation with people who've already got a master's in something else. So I started with the idea that and some of them come onto my course going, I know exactly what I want to do. I've picked this master's in medical visualization because I want to use augmented reality for face, facial maxillary surgery. They come on to the course with that. Others go, that course looks cool. And they come on to the course and they have no idea what their project is going to be. So that was where I started is I needed a way to represent. I have no idea. I have some idea. I have a very clear idea, but I just need to design it into a project. And from, from there, it kind of exploded into creative or research. Um, are you one of Daisy's students? Are you not? Um, and all the way throughout, you know, I've got lots of, of places where you can choose, like, I want a visual method or a text method, for instance. So it kind of sprang out of the diversity of my cohort in the first place and then just grew from there. But thanks for the question. That was a really good question. It's, it's, the, it's the only good one I have. I, I, just leading from that, because we've talked about branching scenarios before. And one of the problems that people have in, in the past, others who have use this approach is when they started out, they go, this is an awesome idea, bit of personalization, cover all the bases. It, it misses out the bits that you don't need to know it, it, and stuff. There's lots of paths in there. The problem for the author though, is what starts out as a relatively simple task often mushrooms into <laughs> a very, very complicated scenario. And the amount of time that takes is a lot more than it was initially anticipated. Um, how did you find You've gone muted, but um, oh, how did, yeah. I, how, Sorry, yeah. how did, how did find I find it? it? Yeah, it was it was a big task. It, it did, like you said, it didn't need to be. But as I came up with, I will show you what I used as well. A lot of the stuff in there is from me, but a lot of it is from these creative thinking cards, which you can get as a free PDF, or you can purchase the card set. So it's. The same people that do logical fallacies dot what it's called, what is your logical fallacy? It's called School of Thought, and it's an American kind of organization aimed at improving critical thinking. And they do these creative thinking cards, which I'm trying to get to go unblurred. Um, so a lot of it was based on this. So I got this as a learning tool and I arranged them in 
I laid them out and decided whether they were useful early in the process, in the middle of the process or towards the end of the process. And then I kind of um, then I kind of arranged the narrative around that, added a bunch of my own stuff. But I will say that I actually worked on this in my own time because I didn't have time during my professional hours to complete this. So I did it as a, as a hobby project. And then I thought, you know, this is this is going to work. I'll deploy it in a professional capacity as well. And it did take a very long time. And as you can see, it will continue to take a very long time because the narrative is not particularly strong at the moment. The images are a bit placeholder -y. it's a draft so please fill in the survey and tell me how to improve it <laughs> okay somebody has volunteered well done Walter can I talk about the agents of change toolkit I absolutely can so playfulness for organizational change this is a project um, that has just finished which is called the Agents of Change Toolkit, and there's the website. Now, it's aimed that the primary audience for this is schools and school-based education. So I'm just gonna put that there to start with. However, all the theories of change and the game-based learning stuff that we worked on, not all of it is applicable to all educational contexts, but most of it is applicable to all educational contexts. So, I, I mean, the website's great. We've just finished doing it. Everything, pretty much everything should be on that website now. So if you just click this link, you can have a look. Yeah, thank you for that. It's in the chat. You can have a look at what we did. Um, very briefly, we used a co-design process to engage teachers in local changes towards the sustainable development goals. So that's the project was funded for that purpose. Um, and we took a co-design approach. I'll give you my headline reflections on it. Because of COVID, we completely flipped to on that online delivery. And this needed me to convert what would have been a half day workshop in game design with teachers and teachers, not all teachers are game design novices, but most teachers are, have never designed a, a, an educational game before. So it took, needed me to convert a half day in-person workshop into a two hour online workshop, which was a challenge. Uh, but I produced um, a method that I call the serious game rapid online co-design method. Uh, and I've actually published a paper about that, which I presented a couple of weeks ago, which I haven't linked on here. So I'll drop the link on here as soon as I get chance to, to draw breath. Um, so I've published a paper all about this method. Uh, the, the short version is that rapid, co like designing a game in two hours is really hard. But if you're careful about streamlining the process, you can get teachers from knowing nothing about it to a prototype game in two hours. Um, obviously that game needs to be tweaked and worked on to, to be deployable with students after the session. But the time pressure, albeit being very stressful for me as the workshop coordinator and very stressful for the teachers doing it, it's kind of what they described as a grueling but really rewarding process. And adding that time pressure shows the teachers that actually it doesn't need to be perfect. You cannot produce something that's perfect in two hours. So let's just produce something, something at all. And, and scope it down to one change, one change that you can achieve in your school. And in terms of the climate emergency, it takes something that's overwhelming and huge and horrible, and it makes it, no, I don't care about any of that. I'm just going to talk about engaging children with the school garden. OK, now I can do it. Or I'm just going to talk about increasing the healthiness of the, the snacks in the P1 kids. Right, now I can do it. And it doesn't have to be perfect. And it's this idea of lean game design, frugal game design. It's, it's the minimum viable product. And it gives teachers a kind of empowerment and a confidence that they can carry on. So what I will say is this entire method exists as a Miro board, um, which I'm happy to share with people. I am provisionally happy to run it as a workshop, as a game design workshop with you, but it depends on the time that I have to actually deliver that. Um, I might have to deliver it outside of my working hours again. 
So contact me if you're interested in more. I will post the paper um, there. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Um, I'll post the paper there. And yeah, the, the stuff there that I haven't had time to add to this board. So I'll add it all and come back in a week and have another look and see what you think. OK, next. What do you fancy? Shout out someone. I'm not doing it for you. I've I've got to ask about um your your playful interludes. And I, I've just been scrolling around. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. playful interludes. Thanks. Right. So I've got a video. This this here is a video on the, my I yeah, it's on my YouTube channel, so it's publicly accessible, about playful interludes. Now, most of this material is based on a chapter called Playful Interludes by Liz Cable, which is in this book on um, playfulness in adult education. So what is a playful interlude? So it's anything that is like a little pause in your lecturing or a pause in your workshop that has a specific purpose. So if we just have a look at them, there's four types. Icebreakers, most people are familiar with that. Um, energizers, which is, you know, you might get people in a lecture theatre to stand up and just shake, you know, in-person teaching. And on Zoom, it's really important to put energizers in because if you're speaking for an hour on Zoom, we all get really fatigued, you know. So an energizer is something um, that, that just wakes people up again, basically. Group builders, this is for workshops or breakout rooms, anything where you're splitting people into groups. And consolidation, which is how you, you kind of teach some material, but then you do a short activity to consolidate the learning. Now, the high level take home from playful interludes is that they shouldn't be arbitrary. They shouldn't be random. They should serve your learning goals. So if you're doing an energizer, you know, you can get people to stand up and shake their bodies. Great. But how about aligning that with what you're teaching? So if I was going to do a playful energizer right now, I would say, right, run to your house, grab something playful, bring it back and show, hold it up to the camera and show me. So I'm kind of linking the, the topic with, with the interlude. So there's lots more in the videos. Here's some info about why to learn, why to use them. Um, I think if you're interested in this, have a wee watch of this lecture. It's, it's one of the very first videos I recorded in 2020. So it's a bit like, oh, I haven't worked out how to use green screen or anything at that point. So, yeah, it's, it's one of the very first ones. Um, and here's, here's an example of, of a group builder, maybe, or an energizer. So if I click on this, you should see a spinner appearing. So I use this to... Um, in my literature search lecture, which as you can imagine is pretty thrilling stuff, a literature search lecture. Um, so I use quite a lot of playful interludes in my teaching. And one thing I get them to do is I crowdsource good literature for their topic. Uh, and this is a way of sort of randomizing what they're looking at. So this student has rolled a non-academic resource. So they're trying to find a magazine or some governmental policy about medical visualization or about game-based learning. And then somebody else would roll again and they would, oh, same one. Well, that was unfortunate, but you get the idea. So it sort of randomizes things. So here's somebody's trying to find an academic journal. And this tool's called Wheel Decide, Wheel Decide, uh, and you can embed it in, in your lecture powerpoints miro boards whatever you like you can embed it in your vle um so I, I use this all the time oh there's the link to flipperty that I was talking about flipperty's got loads of stuff it's got like pair games um badging lots of fun stuff i think there might be a crossword thing there as well so the, these are all things that you can use to do playful interludes. Another one, so emoji icebreakers. I use this one quite a lot with students, so I'll do it right now. Just post, post in the corner of your little screen. If you know how to do it in Zoom, just post a little emoji about how you're feeling right now, for instance. Or you can post it in the chat. Nice. Okay. So just little kind of interludes that, that, that enhance your teaching, but also kind of, you know, enhance the emotion in the room as well. <laughs> okay, next. What's next? 
time is a ticking. What about escape style games? Escape style games. Thank you for asking. Right. Escape style games. So I did uh, uh, in 2019 um, an escape game for the GSA library because they were doing their induction as a, a sit down PowerPoint. And I thought, what? I mean, escape games, I think, are brilliant for inductions. Any kind of transition. So people coming into the institution, people leaving the institution, people going up to postgrad, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they're really suited to that. Um, so I made this thing called Crack the Library uh, and there was papers taped underneath their chairs and they had to, the library staff actually said they didn't want students to be running around the library space. So I did it kind of static at a computer, um, but it, it, it helped them to understand the structure of the library building as well. You Where would you find a comic? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it was it, it was not particularly rigorously tested, I have to say, but it was deployed by the library staff. Um, and then COVID happened. And so I changed it into an online version of this escape game using an app, a free app, have a link to it. It's linked. It's linked on the Maths Weeks one, ones over here. I can't remember what it's called, Escape Team, it's called. And it's a free app, which lets you put in your own five digit number and it plays kind of spy music and the, the students tap the numbers in on their phone and it, it, it goes bing and unlocks it. And it, it's quite good for doing online escape games. But this was, I think, pedagogically not successful because when people are doing something online, they don't have any scaffolding. You know, they don't have the librarians there to support them. And so with an escape game, if a student ever gets stuck, the learning has to stop. Yeah, because they're stuck. So without clues being given to them, they, they, they don't carry on learning. The event, the, the, the whole activity has to grind to a halt. So I was very nervous about this. So I made it, the puzzles really are, are very easy. You know, they're not, they, they still go through the process of doing a literature search and using the library website and working out how you get in the building and all that kind of stuff. But it just wasn't puzzly enough because I couldn't risk the students not being able to solve the puzzles. And therefore, I mean, it's maybe arguably still better than a PowerPoint, but it's basically a glorified worksheet at this point. It's a step by step kind of vaguely spy themed click through a worksheet and it just doesn't work as well. So what I would say about live uh, about escape games is they're hard. They're hard to get right. You have to test them a lot. And I don't think they work without a system for supporting and giving clues. That would be my opinion on this. On the other hand, have a look at these bad boys. I did these totally out of work context. I did these for my kids' school. I used the same app and I did a series of, um, <laughs> thanks, Beth. I did a series of, of mathematicians who aren't white men. So it was for Maths Week. I mean, I got some, I don't think I even got any funding for this because I didn't need any funding. Um, so I, I did all the drawings and I aligned all of the puzzles in these uh, in these escape games are aligned to the kind of maths that the mathematician did. So I'm so proud of them because I did one about Florence Nightingale, which was all about infographics and reading graphs because she was an amazing statistician, which most people don't know about Florence Nightingale. And I absolutely love doing them. They've got the most hits out of anything on the school website. And they're great because they're really diverse and, and kind of show something about maths that isn't what maybe school kids think of maths being. So these worked really well online, but the, the induction, not so much, I think. And the last thing I'd say about escape rooms is have a look at ThingLink because they're really good way of um, that. You can have 360 images in ThingLink and you can put, things on them. So if you haven't used ThingLink before, have a click on this and have a think about how you might be able to use that as a kind of immersive, not exactly VR, but somewhat more immersive um, escape room deployment. I haven't done one in ThingLink, but if you do one, send me a copy because it looks looks good fun. Okay, not sure how long we have left. We might be able to squeeze in one more. 
we have four minutes left. So four definitely minutes. time for one last question. Quick, quick, quick. You, you just know I'm going to edit out these pauses. <laughs> I really That's want good. to ask about taking tabletop games online, but that would definitely be more than five minutes. It is. Well, I'll give you the I'll give you the uh, the, the quick tour. So I have um, right. Mm, yeah, I design a lot of games for research skills, including how to fail your research degree. And during the pandemic, I had to take it online. This here is a link. Um, under the under the picture here, you can click on that and you can have a play with this using a platform called playingcards.io. It's pretty good. It's pretty versatile. Um, it's not that fully functioned, but it's anything that's sort of basically a tabletop game without anything too complicated in it, you can recreate in playingcards.io. This here, Kenji, is the amazing video with the nearly 4,000 views. <laughs> so it's linked over here. Do watch this tutorial because it's not as intuitive as it could be to create games in playingcards.io and they delete themselves after an unspecified period. So you need to take a copy, you need to export a copy and keep it on your computer so that you can put it back later. So have a watch of that video. I'm going to give you some info that is not uh, yet. There's one down here, but it's private to GSA. So I'm going to give you... Um, an overview of what I learned taking tabletop games online. Students mess about and cheat more than they do in real face-to-face -face tabletop games. I don't know why, but there's something about putting just Zoom call, everybody goes on one board. They steal cards from each other. They would never lean across the table and steal cards from each other. But there's a kind of um, freedom that comes with an online implementation of a game. Perhaps it's a confusion with the, um, with the interface. Perhaps it's just freedom that they want that person's card and they can just steal it. But they, they, there's some emergent behaviors that were quite unexpected. What I'm gonna try and do, Kenji, is I'm going to um, have a look at this video and make sure that I can, that it's suitable for public consumption. At the moment, it's internal to, to GSA, but I'm gonna see if it's suitable and I'll put it on my YouTube channel. And then you can see all my kind of reflections on taking tabletop games online. Here's two examples. I didn't design this one on the right, but I did put it in the online platform. So again, just have an explore of these materials in your own time. I think that's probably my four minutes. Just about last minute coming in too. So some some final thoughts about why isn't everyone taking this approach? Why? What, what's the barrier to games based learning? Because the things that you do with your students seem like completely successful. And when you delivered a workshop for us and we brought people into a room and brought them to the table and played through the game, the universal experience for everyone was this is great. I'm enjoying this and I'm learning. So what's the problem? Well, OK, <laughs> it's a big question. So first thing I'm going to say is here's data that I've collated from my students on my course. You can see that the thing that they loved the most is interactivity games and quizzes. They love this stuff. They absolutely do want it in their courses. Students like to learn, especially dare I say, boring subjects like research skills, which is what I teach, you need to make the most effort you can to make it as interesting as possible because it can be really dry. So yes, they absolutely do work. The data shows it. The biggest barrier is a lack of confidence and expertise in matching instructional design to game design. And, and that's just the way it is. There's no way around that. Game design, educational game design is interdisciplinary. There is no way of avoiding that. So unless you have the freedom, as I do in my role, to do research on both of those things and do research on how to bring them together, it's quite a rare skill set. So the, the to, I'm going to try and propose a solution to the, to the barrier, which is work with other people, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate take all the tools that people have produced and I will give you everything that I've produced over here is my big list of stuff you can have. Um, I'll give you everything I've got, but you need to collaborate with someone who knows what they're doing. And that goes for game designers too. If you're a great at game design, but you're not a good instructional designer, find yourself a teacher because they know what they're talking about. 
Um, a second big barrier is technology and confidence with technology and the fact that technology changes very rapidly. And half the things on here, not half, every time I present this, one thing has like expired or changed. They've changed the URL. Flippity went through a period of not working because the Google API had changed. You know, there's, it, it's rapid and it takes a lot of keeping up with. I, I think what you've done is left us a lot to play with over the festive break. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my winter sorted um, as my kids get busy opening their presents. Right. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Daisy. As always, educational and fun. Right. Um, that's the end of our recorded part of this session. Um, please do enjoy the festive break and hopefully come back in 2022 and join us for the next series of Virtual Bridge sessions. But until then, as always, stay safe.